Y añado. And let me add also Potter Romero from the platform for a new energetic model. Sergio Cutillas from the Observatory of Debt and Globalization. Anthony Fuertes. Uh, Carlos Sánchez Mato from Attack, Accordem, Sánchez Mato, Attack Spain, Marcellesi, Equo, Falso Agallo, Parti de Gauche, and unfortunately he's going to come later because he's had problem, problems, Francisco Malcani, Sinestra, and Paloma Lotez, member of the Parliament of Izquierda Unido, and Fernando Lezcano, responsible for organizations of Comisiones Obreras. Apologies if I did not pronounce the names correctly, she said. And without further ado, because we don't have much time, because we're running quite late, like everybody from the South, very typical, I will give the floor to the first speaker. So I will introduce one by one my comrades, and they will take the floor. So first of all, I'm going to give the floor to the one on my right, from a geographic perspective, not political, who is Alberto Garzón Espinosa, who is a comrade of the Spanish Communist Party. He's a colleague of Izquierda Unida. He's also economist. He's author of many articles and co-author of books and publications. And he's a parliamentarian by Malaga of the Popular Left. Secretary of the Constituent Process of Izquierda Unida. And I would also like to highlight in this special case the very important work he has done on things related to debts and transatlantic treaty. So, Alberto, you have the floor. <laughs> Microphone. No. Now, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. We can hear him. Thank you very much, Maite. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. I think it's a very necessary meeting. This type of event is very necessary. And because I don't have much time, I have to be precise and concise, even if I leave some elements out of my talk. But I think that the panel and all the interventions are going to be enough in order to offer you an alternative to the model which is being implemented right now in Europe. Let me start, first of all, warning to Maite. Please be strict with time, because I tend to speak a lot. Let me start by telling you that what's at stake in Europe it's not only some governments within the framework of the European Union. What's at the stake is not the correlation of forces in the national parliaments. It is obvious that there are some uh, voting objectives in Europe. The closest one is in Greece next Sunday. So we give them as much support as we can. We have even started this platform of support to the Greek people and this support to Syriza, which we introduced weeks ago with great support thanks to the parliamentarians and public figures of all Europe, this solidarity. But it's very important to point to the fact that what's at the stake is not only that, but the new social order. We are implementing a new social order in the whole of the European Union, which will save capitalism from its own crisis thanks to the different neoliberal proposals which transform the way we live. It is important to highlight that now that the Troika, with the complicity of the national government, is applying very strict measures on the public sector, taking away from people their capacity to decide on their own lives and public resources, but also their own democratic instruments. And when this happens, uh, this Troika is consolidating a new economic model which is based in precarity and privatization, in a difficult neoliberal system which will even make even worse the, citizen, the citizens' conditions. This is already happening in some countries, and they want to give support to this new 
model of society. And they said that these policies of the Troika are justified because we have two models in Europe. The first model is the German one, the successful one. And the other model is the model of the South, which would be a failure. And this is applied to in a very dramatic way, such as in the cultural uh, uh, field, for example. They say from the people of the Mediterranean, they are too lazy, they don't work enough, and therefore they need the democracy and good political measures in order to solve their problems. Of course, there is corruption in Greece. Of course, there is corruption in Spain. But these are not the main causes of what's happening now and the contradictions of the European Union, because what we see now is the failure of the European Union the way it has been designed. That is to say, there's not good and bad models, good one German, bad one Mediterranean. They both belong to the same failed project of the European Union. It's a symbiotic growth model. Germany was growing because they needed the South to grow in uh, just Greece and Spain have done. And this, in economic terms, has been translated into unbalances of the accounts. Uh, we imported much more than we exported, but the North exported much more than what they imported. And this lack of balance had contributed to this bubble in Spain. And this explains the reasons of the crisis. Before, we were saying that we have gone through a very specific process in the South, Spain, Greece. Since we joined the European Union, the mm, disindustrialization process, we have changed our productive structure. Nowadays, in Greece, the weight on manufacturing process, of manufacturing process on the total is 10%, in Spain 17%, Germany 23%. The weight of this lack of industrialized activities have dropped based on this theory of competitive advantages. Spain and Portugal have a peripheral role to play depending on some economic powers of the North. But it's also important to point to the fact that what do we want to build as a society, as an economy, we should say that the weight of high and medium technologies in Greece is 1.5%. So their exports, their industrial production is mainly of a low, medium low technology because of high and medium high technologies, 1.5 in Spain, 1.4 in Germany of 11%. And this is where we find the explanation. The highly specialized industries of Germany in high added value products, which represent a better working conditions than the ones that we have in productive structures, such as the one of Spain, very much tourism oriented, precarity oriented, and these trash contracts, contracts by hours, unstable contracts, lack of certainty, and therefore the neoliberal interpretation, which means to lower the salaries of the South in order for us to be uh, more competitive is a fallacy. It's not going to work. Uh, what it does is to increase the social gap in the South of Europe. In our opinion, the best solution goes through rebalancing the weight of productive structures between the North and the South taking into account criteria which are going to be explained in this forum. For example, the environmental criteria, labor criteria, financing aspects. But it's also important to defend that fact from the very beginning, the fact that says that in Spain what we have are defects due to high salaries. That's not true. It's not a question of having high salaries and the solution doesn't go through labor reforms such as the ones approved by the Popular Party and the Socialist Party in order to lower our salaries to export cheaper products and to get out of this crisis. This is the path to the disaster. This is why austerity measures are not working in Greece, the south of Europe, Spain, or Portugal, or best said they're only working for a minority of the population, which is getting richer and richer. We have to take this economic problem into account because it's the social political problem. The lack of political stability 
is due to an economic instability. Only by reading the economics will we understand uh, the political results. There is a main mistake in the design of the European Union. The European Union has not been the romantic union of the peoples of Europe, a union of the banks and transnational companies which have designed the architecture of the European Union, the treaties, legal framework in order to benefit the big financing and non-financing entities. This is where the problem lies, and this is where we have the need to uh, solve this problem. So this productive structure is what we have to solve. We have to think about how to organize ourselves from an economic perspective, to ask ourselves, what are we going to produce? How are we going to distribute this? And how are we going to consume this? And not only from an economic point of view, we are talking about the price of energy, ecologic, gender, the model of society that we want for the future. This is why I want to invite you not to think about the next elections, but the next generations, because the social order that we are building is not in the short term. We're thinking about the long term. So we have to pay attention to all these questions from now. And I think that we will be able to do it because we are facing a historical opportunity and we have to think about the problems. It's not only a question of changing governments, but systems. And in order to change the systems, we have to be aware of the fact that we want to do it. So we need debates like this one, which will be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. It is true that one has to remind him of the time, but it's worth listening to him. I would like to use this opportunity to introduce my colleague to my left and to thank Iniciativa por Catalunya Verts for the good work they've been doing for the previous months, because preparing today's forum has been a daunting task for many, many months. And I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to thank you, because, of course, with Esquerra Unida and Alternativa, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you very much, comrade. Thanks to all of you. I think that in Catalonia, it's very complicated to introduce Laia, degree in political and economic science, who's been working in politics for so long because she belonged to the Juventudes already. And I think that we have to recognize everything she has done in the field of women and the feminist women here. would like to thank you for such an important job. Because today and tomorrow, Alberto has already mentioned things related to women. And now, as you know, She's been a Catalan member, European member, and she's parliamentarian of the plural left, plus responsible of international relations, and spokesman of Iniciativa por Catalunya Verts. Laia, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Everybody. It's a great honor for the whole team of my party to be able to organize such a forum. I think that all of you who are here, we know that solutions should not be individual unilateral decisions, and that's why it's very important to have spaces of coordination and complexity, because in the end, we I have to expose the ideas on behalf of all of Europe. A panel like this one will give us food for thought for a week. And when I saw that Alberto and Janice were here, I thought they would talk about that. But let me tell you that the meeting in which the left the environment. Social organizations are starting to think about solutions. We understand there are some urgent solutions, the weight of debt, the urgency of liquidity, how do we rescue from a social point of view the classes. This is an immediate emergency. But on the same priorities, we should know how to spend 
where do we spend and what economic model we want to build. Because unless we have the same priorities, we will make the same mistakes. And the questions and the reflections that I want to translate here are fundamental when it comes to approaching the short term or how do we solve the problem of debt, which is a non-financial problem, but a democratic problem in itself. Neoliberalism has forgotten the definition of economy. One of the definitions of economy is the way to satisfy human needs through available resources, which are always limited. We all agree that if the, there is something the economy is not doing is to satisfy uh, human needs. We produce and consume many things which are not necessary for life, but we are deprived of other things which are necessary for people, and austerity is accelerating this. And if something the economy does not take into account is that the material resources are limited, so the expansive dynamics of the system has opted, and when it comes to choose between human life and economic benefits, they have chosen human benefits. This is something to take into account if we want to design a solution, not only to this crisis, but the economic system, which is endangering not only this question of inequality, but the civilization, the whole of civilization. Let me play some specific uh, reflections, but I think that this uh, had to be placed on the table. One of the things that we have to think in, we have to take into account, is the systemic crisis, which is climatic and energetic, Keynesianism in the 21st century, classic Keynesianism of incentivating demand which require a growing needs of material resources. Can we use recipes in an unequal world where labor is the only instrument of redistribution when we're in the middle of a problem in society? Or should we think about new instruments of redistribution of this economy, which is getting more and more unequal? with uh, growing fraud. Is it useful to go to a developing logic based on the idea of uh, cheap fuel? Now fuel is cheap or cheap energy. Is it going to be useful in order to survive as a civilization? I think that uh, it is not right to think about solutions based on what's valuable for economy. Of course, uh, there are some non-remunerated jobs which are fundamental for human life, economy of care. How do we take care of the, those who are dependent from us? And the badly called austerity is doing without highlighting the importance of these activities. Having said that, five questions, key questions, in order to think about the response we should approach the left and ecology. On the one hand, the diagnosis of this European crisis should have a fundamental question, which is talking about responsibilities and shared responsibilities. Alberto was saying that causes and solutions. We should have a different perspective compared to the European Union. Some countries have spent more than what they could spend especially in public services. This is completely false. None of the imbalances of this crisis has to do with investing too much in public services. Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland. We have to take into account that the responsibilities of this imbalance are shared. The non-fulfillment of the European Union started in Germany when an excess of savings injected credit to the economies of the South, increasing the bubbles and the imbalances of our productive system. Second question, when we talk about solutions and shared responsibilities, that means talking about debts. And talking about debts means to audit, to have a transparent perspective how this debt was generated. And here we see 
some multiple products. Probably uh, Milos will think will talk about it, and we should talk legitimate and legitimate. Who pays for the cost of each one of the solutions? that we are going to introduce. And this is very important to know what we pay, when do we pay, how much do we pay, and who gets the cost of this solution. But on the other hand of this liquidity, we should decide in which are we going to invest once we have liquidity. A monetary policy cannot be separated from a fiscal common policy, and this is fundamental. And this is a big imbalance of the European Union which has questioned the institution. And we have to think about European sovereignty, paying attention to the singularity of each one of the countries, not to talk about authoritarian federalism, but we need sovereignty from a European level. If we want a fiscality, we have to fight against fraud in a global economy. We need a political Europe. We don't have a political Europe, and this is why we have uh, political problems in our institution. Of course, we have to uh, run away from this Juncker affirmation saying that Juncker, if Greece prefers um, well-known faces and when they think that uh, these programs cannot be fulfilled. This is not a political union. This is a bribe within the same institution, and this is what the European Union is saying. Therefore, we need uh, European sovereignty, but also democracy, proximity democracy, reinforcement of a territorial organization, and proximal and local participation, and this is what we should talk about. Second question, economy for the citizens requires more regulation and intervention. If a crisis has proven something, is that the chaos comes from deregulating. We are deprived, thanks to the European policies of pol capacity, to talk about energy, water, basic services, and then the financial system, which has been completely deregulated, causing the economic disaster. If there is something we should learn, it's something that we have to regulate. We should talk about more than growth, share prosperity, because there are some absurdity. For example, does it make sense that Spain imports 200,000 kilos of uh, chicken but export 300,000 kilograms of chicken? Uh, does it make sense? Or oh, maybe Germany will produce uh, solar energy and import gas from Algeria, and we are using uh, renewable energy. Or maybe the mobile, the infrastructure of security used by uh, the population, or maybe de investing in mobility. And I think these are the questions that we have to take into account when we talk about investing. Investing for whom and for what. And this is very important. The decisions made at the national level, they've been a disaster, but also the decisions made by the European Bank of Investment at the Juncker Plan. A fourth reflection. For a shared responsibility, we need common goods and basic goods. The policy of liberalization of the European Union has contributed to deprive us to of basic things such as water, energy, but also basic public services of paying attention to people. And this is something we have to recuperate from municipalism and local policies and sovereignty of these goods and talking about common goods. And fifth, when we talk about this, where to grow and how to grow, this is where we have to talk about this new green pack. This is the transition economy. And this is not green capitalism. We have to fly away from this green capitalism. The neoliberal is a pact, democratic pact with all the democratic sectors in order to decide what do we do with our economy and how to make our resources available for people, especially in this Europe dominated by oligopolies, to combat this economy 
serving big corporations and facilitating from institutions, democratic institutions, and promoting cooperativism, social contracting, and organizations of the workers. And this is where we have this Green New Deal, this that in favor of people. And this is what the Commission wants to do in order to get out of the crisis. I think this is fundamental when we talk about what we do with the debt. Where do we invest our money? Money is invested in people, taking into account the ecologic mortgage that we are. Before giving the floor to our next speaker, I would like to say that in the colleagues we have here with us, we have Ray Tavares, who is MP in the European Parliament from Portugal. Thank you for being here. And I would like to say also that there has been a political organization in Spain that has worked really hard in order to organize the seminar, even if they are not mentioned in the Communist Party of Spain, we have uh, Jose Luis Centella, uh, its general secretary. And I could like to say that last Sunday I was in Barcelona. Well, I was in San Adrián de Besos. I don't know the correct pronunciation. And we chose a new general secretary, Albert Miralles. Gracias. Uh, thank you, Albert, for being here. And now I'll try to introduce a friend, a colleague, called Yanis Milios, with whom I've worked a lot. I've known him for many years. And I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I hope next week we'll have an important post because Syriza, this would mean that Syriza has won the elections with an absolute majority. Introducing Yanis Milios, it's more complicated because he's uh, an intellectual figure in Europe in the economic and economic field. He's professor at the Polytechnic University in Athens. He has written several books. I don't know if the economic uh, newspaper is still printed. He's going to tell about this later on. He is responsible for the economy in Syriza. He is a mechanical engineer also. It's something that has also always puzzled me, being an economist. He's traveled a lot throughout the world as a good uh, internationalist and Marxist. And I think he was uh, studying with Papandreou also. And together with Dimitris Dimoulis and Yorgos Ekonomakis, and you'll excuse my pronunciation of uh, Karmas and the classics, I think that it's a good introduction for my colleague and friend, Yanis. So, Yanis, you've got the floor, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Maite. I think we are living historical moments, not only in Greece, but all over Europe. These are historic, historical mo moments for the left of the Europe, for the plural left of this country, but not only this, for the people of Europe. And uh, so let's discuss one major uh, uh, common problem that we have. The common problem is austerity, and very close connected with it is the sovereign debt problem. Uh, what is austerity? They tell us that austerity is a method to achieve fiscal consolidation. This is wrong. They tell us that austerity is a method to create growth. This has been also proven wrong. We tell us that austerity is a method to create jobs. This has also proven to be wrong. In all countries of Europe, 
north or south, austerity has created more unemployment, secular stagnation, deflation, uh, and of course, uh, deteriorated the sovereign debt problem. In the case of the south, and especially in Greece, we have heard already from Cayo Clara the disastrous effects of austerity. So what is austerity overall? Austerity is a class project, is a class product, program. Austerity is the method to concentrate wealth, income, and power into few hands. Austerity is the process of changing Europe, of destroying the European social model, what, what has all, always been the competitive advantage of this uh, area of the world. Austerity is a, a process of creating, if I am allowed to say this, the white Asian worker in Europe. That is a worker without rights, with, uh, who has a very low salary, who works overtime and is paid as a part-time worker and so on. And so we have to, to stop austerity because we are representing the interests on, of the majority of the people. And we have to be aware of the fact that the sovereign debt in Europe has been calculated, has been formed in such a way as to function as an austerity trap. The sovereign debt is an austerity trap because the structure of the Eurozone is such, the role of the central bank, the European central bank is such that the sovereign debt plays this role. The problem is not that more countries have the same common currency, the euro. The problem is that we do not have a central bank which plays the role of a lender in the last resort. Right now, uh, Japan has a sovereign debt of more than 200, uh, a sovereign debt ratio of more than 250 percent and this uh, uh, sovereign debt is sustainable in the means that it can be serviced because the central bank of the country uh, plays the role of a lender in the last resort. If any country, New Zealand, had decided, that, this, that is the elites had decided that the Bank of New Zealand does not uh, directly finance or lends the uh, state of New Zealand, then the result would be the same as the one we have in Europe. So we have to tackle the uh, problem of the sovereign debt. We have to, to restructure it. We have to open it as a European problem. In the case of Greece, if you look at the latest report of the IMF on Greece, tables two and three, you are going to see in table three the cash flows, that is the money the country has to pay under the present conditions in order to service the debt, that is to pay the interest. This is table three. In table two, you are going to see the primary surplus, that is what is above uh, the, 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 um, the state revenue that exceeds state expenditure, the, the primary surplus that has to be created in order that the sovereign debt is being serviced. And you will realize that this primary surplus from the next year on, for many years, is something around the double of the cash flow of what the country has to, 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 to pay because they have agreed, the present government, that uh, the, uh, the sovereign debt is uh, serviceable, is sustainable by creating this enormous primary surpluses which are going to uh, pay not only for the interest, but for the debt itself, that is for the capital of the debt, 
for the um, uh, for the debt uh, uh, as a quantity of money. And this is ridiculous if you uh, think of it from an economic point of view, except if you think of it from a class point of view, from the point of view of the elites, of the oligarchy, of big capital, and you, you are going to see that they, it's rational in this way because exactly it plays the role of an austerity trap. That is, if things stay as they are, the government, any government, will have to uh, create these primary surpluses and this is going to deprive the economy and the state of the ability to use uh, the resources of the country in order to promote uh, growth policies and, of course, social policies. And we have to negotiate on it, we have to uh, fight in order to change it, we have said um, a lot of times that we don't want, as a new government, to uh, default. Default is going to be a very severe situation, not only for Greece, but for the whole European Union. It's going to hit the European Central Bank. It's going to hit the credibility of the Union. That's why we have and we are going to find a solution. There is no other way, full stop. So we have to uh, tackle this major problem. Uh, we have from the beginning raised the solution given to Germany in the year 1953. Uh, in, at that time, of course, the historical conditions were very different, but there was one common element. The Federal Republic of Germany had, had been tra uh, trapped at that time but th by the enormous uh, uh, debt which was partly created, was partly created due to the war. So, they had to create uh, enormous surpluses or to be, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to forget of uh, big resources in order to pay the debt. And Greece belonged to the debtor countries at that time and had agreed to excuse the larger part of the German debt and allow the rest to be paid under the condition of an export clause which is similar to a growth clause. So we raise this solution because it has a very high uh, ethical and symbolic value. The issue is that we cannot, as European people, as European societies, afford the given uh, uh, sovereign debt with the structure that we have in the Eurozone. And you know probably, or you surely know, that in the five years that are going to follow, that is in the uh, period uh, 2015 to 2020, uh, 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 Spain, the Spanish state, is going to have a major problem with the sovereign debt because more than 50% of the Spanish sovereign debt matures in this short period. So you are going either to pay half of the debt in uh, five years or to let it be by refinancing it through the markets and you will always be dependent on the markets and the markets will determine the policies and will keep the interest rates low only if neoliberal policies continue. This is their plan. We have to have another plan and that's why we are talking about a European debt conference in order to discuss and find a different solution for the, uh, for the sovereign debt overhang in Europe, on all over Europe, as we the people, we the European people, to find the alternative solution. The alternative solution has to have one major characteristic, to, characteristic, to bury austerity forever. 
we have to seek a solution which will allow the restructuring of the debt in a way that austerity is no more needed, but a, a fiscal space is created, which means that progressive governments, left governments, will, ha will have the power and the space to promote growth and social policies. And in order to do this, we have to focus on the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank is a common institution of all the European countries. The European Central Bank can play a different role. Imagine that the European Central Bank, under another uh, relation of forces, swaps the servicing of, this, uh, of the Spanish debt fully for the uh, five next years. That is, undertakes the cost the interest cost and the cost of maturity, of maturing of the Spanish debt for five years. And the f Spanish people and the Spanish state will not uh, have to pay anything on interest or maturities, but will have this fiscal space to promote progressive policies. And that this solution, 50% plus, is applied for uh, reasons of equality to all other states. This is going to be a solution which is feasible, it's within the, uh, the firepower of the ECB, changes the whole uh, uh, climate in Europe, and is one possibility among others. So we need to discuss the debt problem. We need to uh, scrutinize the technical uh, details, that in the technical details the devil lives, as we say, we say in Greece. So uh, if you change the technical details a little, one good solution can become a very bad solution. But we, we have to study it, we have to fight together. It's a common goal, it's a common fight. We have to bury austerity forever, and that's why we have to restructure the sovereign debt problem, to, uh, the sovereign debt of the Eurozone as a, 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 as a whole. We are together, we fight together, and we can win. Before giving the floor to Florian Marcellesi, I'm going to ask Lydia Sendra, EMP, to come to stage, please. Remember that you've got five minutes, and I'm going to give you only five minutes. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you in this first uh, forum. Um, I'm going to switch into Spanish now. I think that if we uh, think about the system we have now, is the system of the five debts. It's an economic debt, first of all, private, public, we all know that we have socialized private losses. We have privatized uh, profits. We have a social debt because the cutback policies, what they do is to generate more poverty, unemployment, inequalities, precari precariousness. We have other debts. We have a democratic debt because the power is full of corrupt governments and oligopolies, the energy oligopoly. We also have a care debt because our capitalist system makes invisible the work uh, of caregivers done by women mainly. And we have also an ecological debt towards the countries in the south. If uh, in the countries in the north we have a well-being state, it's because we have natural resources from the south. So we have a debt uh, with the nature 
and creatures in the nature. And we have that with the future generations because we are jeopardizing their future. We could discuss about gener future generation. My grandparents told me 40 years ago, you'll see in the future. And now it's the future. We are the future generations. And we are facing climate, energy, and humanitarian crisis. So we can say it very clearly. It's more than a regime crisis. It's more than an economic crisis. This is a civilization crisis. This is why we have to come up with an answer and a solution. And the solution is not austerity or growth. Neither of them. Austerity creates more economic social debt, and growth creates more debt and more ecological debt. So we must have a plan, a clear plan, plan in order to provide an answer. And this is called the big ecological and fair transition of society based on job creation, but not all sorts of jobs. Green and decent jobs with a social use and with an ecological dimension. And the good news are that ecology and economy go hand in hand. We can create millions of jobs uh, with the help of ecology in Europe and in Spain. 20 million uh, jobs in uh, Europe by renewing buildings, uh, renewable energies, uh, organic farming. And in Spain, between two to three jobs related to this sector. We, in this way, we would redistribute wealth, economic wealth, social wealth. How do we do this? First, having a look at natural resources, social resources, with a maximum uh, income and a minimum wage, and redistributing also work, or rather, all works. Either they are productive or reproductive. And it's a challenge. It's a democratic challenge. And uh, here we come all from different parties, political parties. It's a challenge for companies, and it's a democratic challenge also, because citizenship uh, has to recover food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, so that we can perform this social transformation. And thanks to this ecological, democratic, and fair transition, we will build the prosperity and a society in which we can live uh, happy within the ecological limits of our planet. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I th think that now I'm going to give the floor to Sergi Cutillas from the Globalization and Debt Observatory, if my pronunciation is correct. Yeah, you have pronounced it correctly. Thank you. I would like to talk about financial debt. And I would like to say that, uh, as it has been said, uh, Greece cannot repay the debt. So this idea of a European Conference on Debt is a very good idea, is a very good proposal. But if this doesn't work, we will have to choose between continuing with austerity or not paying back uh, the debt in a unilateral way. Now the restructuring uh, is being mentioned, and I would like to talk about restructuring debt. It's a term used by the International Monetary Fund, meaning changing old debt by new debt. And in the vast majority of cases, restructuring the debt has the goal to, keep, to make the countries keep on paying. In certain cases, as it has been mentioned, 
1953, some of the German dead uh, was uh, written off. And in this London conference, the conditions, as it has been said, were very favorable. But the reason why these conditions were implemented were geopolitical conditions because they were beneficial for the U.S. in the Cold War period. In Iraq, in, back in 2004, Poland in 1991, uh, after being part of the Soviet bloc, these are the most favorable cases. In the past uh, 60 years, 600 restructurations of the debt. Other cases haven't been very favorable for indebted countries. So we have to be careful. Greece now is facing to this, uh, this situation and is going to negotiate with another party that, uh, with an, another part that doesn't want um, Greece to uh, stop paying the debt. So we must be aware of this, and we have to prepare a B plan, another plan, a coherent one, because the only way to negotiate with weapons, weapons is to have an alternative plan that can work. And the alternative plan, according to our um, opinion, should be doing an a uh, whole audit of, uh, of the financial situation and not paying hatred debt. We could also um, claim that Troika, because of the report they have done, mentioned the treaties and the laws that go beyond the memorandum of understanding of the bailout that uh, violate human rights and go beyond the competencies of the European Union and bailouts also that don't respect the principles enshrined in uh, EU law and the treaties. We have other examples, Argentina, Ecuador, Iceland that show us that it's possible to go beyond. So we have to take into account these examples in order to go beyond the fear we can experience now. Now, Francesco Martone, Sinistra Ecologia Libertà. Thank you to all of you for giving us the opportunity to share this important moment. I'm going to stand up, yeah? Thank you. My party is currently organizing a program conference where we are going to share the same problems and topics and how to face austerity debt, how to have a production system which respects uh, rights and environment, how to build a political Europe that respects our rights. A few days ago, I was reading data related to what uh, we are mentioning now. Debt is an ecological, human, and social debt. In my country, according to official uh, documents of the Commission, the European Commission, austerity has uh, stolen 100 days of life to the next uh, generation who was born in 2013 is going to live 100 days less because of the impact of the cutbacks for the ecological impact uh, of the natural resources extraction. Climate change, we spend 900 million per year at the global level to explore uh, fossil resources. Nature published that in order to stop the global warming by two degrees, we have to renounce the extraction of 82% of fossil resources right now. And we have to face this problem. We have to face the oil extraction. My government, despite all uh, what they say about the debt and austerity and uh, bailout, the government is dismantling labor rights. 
is opening the Mediterranean Sea to the oil extraction. So refusing financial and ecological debt are very important to construct, to build a new policy. It's not possible to impose uh, the payment of a debt, as it has been said, as it has been made in the countries of the South, with the conditions imposed by the Troika, because we have to build a political and democratic Europe. And institutions cannot build this Europe. Our political parties that belong to different political families, European, Green, Progressives, are starting a common path. We are starting here a common path, opening up in Milan a collective space in Athens in Monday. And we think that this can be a process in which political parties, social movements can work together. There is a human debt also. We are looking towards Brussels, Frankfurt, to the north. And we have to look to the south, to the sea. 25,000 immigrants have died in recent years in the sea. When we talk about the south, we talk about uh, our South, the unfairness of Frontex, the opening and closing, closing of our borders, how we open our borders to goods and we close them to human beings. So we have to have an agreement at the Mediterranean level. This is a way to build an alternative to uh, austerity and neoliberalism. Thank you very much. I don't know where we are. Okay, now I give the floor to Lydia Sendra, member of the European Parliament, left Galician alternative. Member of the Parliament by L'altra Europa per Tsipras. She's also going to take place in this debate. Eleonora, you have the floor. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to switch to Spanish because of the interpretation. I was saying that I'm very, very happy to be here because we are trying to design our hopes about what we want the future to be for the European citizenship and the citizenship of the South. I think that next 25th, next Sunday, for sure, we will be, we will have a bit more of hope, a bit more hopeful because probably the victory of Syriza will be a point which will strengthen our relations and will strengthen our fight. But also in the hopes and the design that we have for this future is the right and the recognition of the right to decide of the peoples which made up the reality of the Spanish state. And for me, and for the organizers and the organization I belong to is something very important for this future. Second, I would like to propose something which usually stays quite forgotten in the policies and big policies unless it's in order to make our survival even more difficult. We're talking about life, we're talking about future, and there are some key elements in life. One of them is food, and the other one are common goods, such as water, earth, or seeds. 
and I would like in this future that we are thinking about, I would like to introduce the concept of fighting for new agrarian and agroalimentary policies in the framework of food sovereignty. Before, my colleague Floren has already mentioned this subject, but I would like to go deeper into this problem. And let me tell you that uh, peasant agriculture contributes to society with lots of wealth and richness, with uh, healthy and quality food, uh, preserving the environment and contributing to generate uh, jobs and wealth in all the European peoples. Right now, the different agrarian neoliberal policies are destroying this peasant agriculture, and we are facing a couple of challenges from a European perspective. One, the liberalization of the milk products, and second, negotiations for the Treaty of Free Trade with Canada which uh, is going to be submitted for ratification very soon, and also with the United States. And thirdly, uh, as far as public goods, I think that Earth right now is also a battlefield in which socially we should compromise ourselves because right now the multinationals are trying to gain terrain all over the world, also in Galicia and in the rest of the countries of the South and the European Union. These big projects of mining and multinational companies in Canada with gold projects which are trying to occupy hundreds and hundreds of hectares that's happened in in Galicia and other parts of Europe. As far as the question of water, it's not only privatization of the management of water, but also the privatization of water as a public good. And in this case, in the case of Galicia, a law has been enacted, and when it will be completely applied, will mean the privatization of water. And finally, let me talk about the question of seeds. Seeds, right now, we have just approved in the European Union a new reglement, a new law on transgenics. Uh, genetically modified products. And the reality is that um, it's going to mean an acceleration, important acceleration, of GMOs and authorization of GMO seeds, which will represent in these states where it's going to be approved contamination of agriculture and uh, the way we eat. And the states which do not authorize all these are going to be exposed to contamination because there are no barriers which can uh, stop the wind or insects. And this is another reality that we are facing in this thirst of control by the transnational corporations. I think I probably went beyond my time. Might uh, I present my apologies. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Lidia. Interesante. Tiene la palabra. Thank you, Lidia. I now give the floor to Antonio Fuertes from Attack. Hola, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. On behalf of Atanac, I have to talk about fiscal paradise and the need to adopt some measures to end with them in Europe. Fiscal paradises and European uh, paradises. I have a text I have written down, so I would read it. The European Union has been built as a financial space without any regulating authority, therefore, uh, and control. For the European Central Bank, uh, they don't have any merits leaving aside the financial system in the hands of markets. Common neoliberal policies have been signed and ratified by the states without debate. And they have prescribed the absolute freedom in the movement of capitals and outside the European Union. At the same time, those policies allow the opaque activity of fiscal paradises of the European environment with the states at uh, the disposal of um, global uh, finance and, and powers. These fiscal paradises make the European Union vulnerable, reducing uh, public income through fiscal policies, generating abusive uh, 
things and allowing the bank to be outside supervision, provoking the financial uh, terrorism and crime. The European Union does not react and does not control the sovereignty power. Uh, making this opacity of fiscal paradises. And it allows three fiscal paradises and does not regulate its relationship with the other seven territories of the European economic space. Uh, signing preferable agreements, competing at the same time in an unfair way with the rest of the countries. They have only one aim, to make the European Union uh, in the hands of transnational cooperation. These policies have very negative consequences for the member states, undermining the possibilities to satisfy the demands of the citizens. Fiscal paradises mean an obstacle for the European construction, democratic Europe. Therefore, the social and political fight for their eradication is very necessary. But all the governments of the European Union and the European Union recognize the legality of the legal order which uh, host the banking uh, secret and the special vehicles as legal entities in the hands of mobile services. European citizenship uh, cannot do anything about this loss of economic and social rights due to the crisis, and they have to react and mobilize in Europe in order to question what's at the base, which is the reason for the loss of uh, rights. Uh, imposing themselves to the sovereignty of some countries. Fiscal paradises are, together with the development, the speculation of public debt for the saving of finance systems and system privatization of the banking system and the attack to fiscal systems and weapons of mass destruction undermining democracy in Europe and does not allow this building of Europe. Governments chosen by people should have should legislate avoiding disaster policies from the summit of G20 in London with the pretext to implement these measures have made a mockery on the citizenship, making possible these territories to uh, disappear the list of fiscal paradises of the OCD, ODCD. Uh, organized society should ask the different policies to deploy the flag against fiscal paradises in the European Union and organize themselves to introduce some measures. Measures are the following. Parties of the European left should defend the compact against fiscal paradises in Europe, and the European society should organize itself. Sharing secret should be an imperative, and the European Union has to reconsider the preferential approach towards these countries. Without any doubt, we should introduce in the political agenda of Europe the need to reach bilateral agreements of exchange of information from the European Union, from these territories, and the different authorities should be able to gather the information according to their democratic functions. We should actively promote a debate for the change of the accounting methods of society, making it possible for societies to declare their benefits. Governmental authorities and fiscal paradises should promote legislative measures. So from the administration, we should not contract those companies who are present in fiscal paradises. If this is interpreted as a fiscal union, we should start by fiscal agreements and the European economic space. That's impossible with fiscal paradises. The fight for the evolution of fiscal paradises, black holes of finance, it's an ecological social imperative, and this forum should issue a declaration. Well, thank you very much. So please send us the text you have read in order to be distributed, because it's very, very powerful. It will be very useful if most people who are here have this text. And we would like to read it and to be able to share our comments with you. Thank you. 
now we give the floor to Paloma Lopez, European parliamentarian from the Google and the plural left. Thank you, Maite. You look like the president of the European Parliament when he gives us a minute to express whatever in one minute, and then you cruelly stop us with the microphone. Well, first of all, congratulations for organizing this seminar. I think they're very timely. Let me talk about labor, of course, but I would like to start by talking about what happens in the European Parliament. When we reach the commissions and we present alternatives, we have many, we reach the European Parliament in the working commissions, we present them and they refuse them. They say they are not realistic enough. And why does this happen? Because we are only working with a single framework, the neoliberal framework. And everything outside this neoliberal framework is outside what they call realistic, what can be applied and what can be done. Therefore, all of us who are outside this framework, we are outside the system and we become something else. But of course, not the ones who have an alternative or a way out. Uh, for the society we are living. And we have to say, and this is why we have to talk about neoliberalism, we have to say that these neoliberal policies are a monument to the lack of coherence. There is no money for people, but there is money for the banks. We cannot spend in public services, but we uh, subsidize private management, increase of VAT, but the debt is still increasing. And all this, of course, from a very perfect economic and social planning, although they say that other political actors are the ones planning. But there is a common element between the dictatorship of the markets and the Troika and this neoliberalism, which means a concerted strategy against work, labor, against uh, fair employment and against the organization of workers which, who guarantee these rights. Labor reforms and massive unemployment are weapons, weapons in which we concretize the attack against labor with a clear unfulfillment of the International Labor Organization. We are not going to see in the next Treaty of Free Trade one of the serious elements which this free trade agreement between the United States and the European Union should include this relaxation of labor normative. The United States have not signed 70 agreements of, with the ILO, among them the right to negotiation of free association to trade unions and conciliation of family work and professional life, etc. And here I'm referring to elements in which we are going to have many problems, but of course we have to fight against them and we have to develop a strong campaign. To turn employment into something precarious is to make the workers lose control of the situation. Employment is not a guarantee of anything. It's decentralized, outsourced, and the economic decisions are made by those who do not respond to people of the serious consequences of their decisions. So regression is not only the result of a crisis, uh, it's not enough going back to the situation before, but we have to transform. And in order to transform, we have to get out of the framework, and we have to think about an alternative that goes through recovering democracy, solidarity, employment, and social rights. We have to reinforce where we come from, from the left and the working majority. That's why our alternative, alternative is re to stratization, the public services, creation of employment, quality employment, and employment is created and shared by putting the economy at the disposal of the employees. And let me conclude by mentioning the professor of labor, Antonio Bailos. You can go into his blog and you will see it. But let me end up with a sentence which says, time has come for hope because the future has a name, dignity, justice, and democracy. This is what the different peoples of Europe require now. Thank you. Thank you, Paloma.